Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as a fact, secretary of the Farm Management Association, the Wilden and Borders branch of that, which actually ceased to exist many, many years ago. It's great to see an audience like this, and uh, it, it's fantastic to think that farm management is becoming a topic, a real topic, a real, a real interest topic again. It's one of these ones which has probably sat in the doldrums for a number of years and for a number of reasons, which I might even touch on. But it really is quite heartening to think that it's, uh, it's, it's an area now which can actually see some sort of real interest and enthusiasm. I have got five, I'm happy to say. <laughs> <laughs> and they are quite different, I think. Um, I've tried to think of it very much in terms of from the, from the farmer's viewpoint. You know, what, is, what, is a, what is a farmer, what is a farm manager actually facing? What are their issues in terms of farm management? Some of the things will be consistent. Some of them you'll see there's definite similarities. But some of them are, are, are I hope, quite different. First one, what, bureaucracy, red tape, procedures. Those are something which the industry struggles to get a grip with, to get, to get to grips with. In the early days of IAX, I remember seeing one, one client who actually, when he, when he put his submission in, he said, I have read <laughs> and understood. And he actually scored out the understood. He said he'd read it. He said he failed to understand it. He got it back. <laughs> he was asked to re-sign it, by the way. But, I mean, that, he actually took that. <laughs> that was his idea of initiative. I've read it, but I don't actually understand it. And I think that's what we see. I mean, we did almost 7,000 IAX forms, assisted with those last year, out of 20, 20-odd 20 thousand that were actually input. That's a significant proportion. And the reason farmers are looking for it is that, you know, if they come to somebody that's done it, 50, 60 times, they know that they're going to somebody that's actually been through it. The pressure on one individual for their business, knowing that somewhere approaching 30% of their turnover is coming from getting that right, is extreme. And therefore, they're looking for help with that. So to me, that is a serious management issue for the, for the industry. It's how do they actually cope with that? And it's not just getting the application in and making sure it's accurate. There's the whole compliance issue around it as well, whether it's statutory management regulations or whether it's geek. It, it never fails to amaze me that even yet, the main breaches in SMRs are in cattle movements and livestock tagging. I mean, that's been around, that, that, that predates IACS. That sort of movement record has been around for a long, long time, and yet that is the biggest single cause of breaches and penalties being applied. And you would think that, you know, as an industry, we would have that you know, pretty well taped. Yeah, particularly with electronic ear tags, all, all the sorts of technology that's there, you would imagine keeping a livestock record would actually be fairly simple and straightforward, and yet the industry needs quite a bit of help with that. And we're seeing passports, passports not returned, all sorts of issues with ear tags, are the sorts of things which, even having got the IAX right, you can fall foul of it in terms of cross-compliance. And I think, much as though... <laughs> People have said, oh, there shouldn't be a fear about it, about having an inspection. There is a definite fear amongst farmers and farm managers that if they get one of those inspections, what are they going to find? There's almost an expectation something's going to be wrong. How, what's going to happen here? There ought to be a higher level of confidence as business managers to know that within my farming business, I've got this taped, I've got this right. So to me, that is one of the real issues, is actually making sure that they have all that. And trying to keep abreast of all that knowledge, all the different schemes that are there that they might be eligible for, that they might not be eligible for, trying to get that information, to distill that down into something which they can actually understand, can sometimes be quite difficult and quite a challenge. And I know there's lots of effort going into guidance notes, online, all sorts of ways of actually getting that information across. But quite often, it actually needs that one-to-one -one interpretation to actually get somebody to really grasp. And often, actually needs that bit of advice that says, well, you know, for your circumstance, this is what you should be looking at. Um, so I think that's an issue for the industry. I think that's it's an industry for farm management is actually learning to cope with that bureaucracy. That red tape. Second one is budgeting and planning. And my question is, why don't farm businesses do budgets and forecasts? All the rest of us, most small businesses, certainly most large businesses, set out and they will do a budget and they'll update it as they go through the year and yet I don't know what the percentage is I reckon it's probably less than two percent of the industry will actually do a budget and actually an even smaller percentage less than half of that if they do it will actually monitor it 
Now, what's the excuses? There's all sorts of excuses given. You know, it's, it's complexity. It's too variable. I don't know what the weather's going to do. The price could go up and down. Well, there is something called sensitivity analysis. So you can actually look at it and actually work out well, what happens if the grain price drops by 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 pounds a tonne. So that can be done. It's not, it's, not that, it's not that complicated. But at the moment, most businesses seem to avoid sitting down and doing a budget, and they certainly avoid doing the monitor. Only when pushed, and Tom alluded to that already, is that that pressure will come on again. It's already coming on. We can see it already. Perhaps for the last decade, very low base rates, very low interest rates, high land values, very secure asset. The banks have taken a view that this is a pretty sure lending prospect, so they've been quite happy to lend against it. Extensions to overdrafts have been relatively easily agreed. Relatively easily agreed. So, there hasn't been the pressure that there, I suspect there will be coming on now, and, will, and which will be sustained, I suspect, for at least the next two or three years, from the banks to say, right, yes, if you want to renew your existing facility, you're going to have to come with a cash flow. They don't just need a cash flow, they want the works, they want to know the P&L, they want to know the balance sheet. It's not just a simple cash flow budget. They need to understand what the business is about. And uh, Tom talked about intensive care, specialised lending services. For those of us that have had the pleasure of trying to support a client through that, that can be quite difficult because the bank is looking at a very precise set of figures and they're taking a view as to the prospects for that business. Is, that, is this a justifiable lending decision for us or not? And that often is now in the hands of a committee somewhere. The autonomy, the authority of a local bank manager now is much, much more restricted than it once was. The local bank manager used to be able to sign off overdraft extensions left, right, and centre. Over lunch. <laughs> over lunch, exactly. After a beer or two, perhaps, even. <laughs> so that, that's what used to happen. Now, most of those will go to a credit committee. The local manager will support it, so he needs to have he needs to be informed and have the information. But the bank, that the farmer, needs to make sure that he's actually got that properly documented. It balances, it's accurate, and it's actually given them a reasonable projection. And he understands what the projection is. The reality is, actually doing the budget is just the mechanics. It's what you do with the results of that budget that's actually important to the business. Do you change strategy, or do you keep going with what you're already doing? Vanity, sanity, reality, and viability. You talked about turnover being vanity, profit is sanity. Cash is king, cash is reality, because that's the bit that actually stops the business uh, trading. But although it doesn't rhyme very well, to me, the most important bit is net worth growth. That's viability. If the business isn't actually growing, it's then stagnant and it's probably going backwards. And to me, it's a disappointment that not enough of our farmers look at the, their tax accounts or, or the quality that's in those tax accounts and actually tries to determine what's happening to the business. The number of businesses that are actually eroding net worth, whether it's personal drawings, whether it's capital investment against and other liabilities, but that net worth is being eroded in some cases and that should be a serious warning sign to any business. Um, and there's, a, there's a lack of knowledge around that and, that, and that, that, that worrying, that's worrying because managers in the industry should have that knowledge. I think to me that's something that as a as a as an organisation, we should set out to try and uh, improve the understanding of that. You see, I've put a few things in inverted commas um, here and there because um, it's the little quotes I've heard from people in the past. Third thing: technical performance. This is normally an area where you can actually start to get farmers really engaged, whether it's lambing percentages, grain yields, costs per kilogram of or per liter of milk, or whatever. You can start to get farmers engaged in that because they seem to have, there are benchmarks there for that, they seem to know those benchmarks. And yet, we still have an enormous gulf between the top third and the bottom third. And that doesn't seem to be narrowing. If you thought the average was going up and the whole thing was moving up like that, that would be marvellous, but that's not happening either. It, is, it just seems to be that we have this broad range of technical efficiency. And there's been all sorts of initiatives, initiatives targeted at trying to improve that. And there's, there's, there's more required. People have looked at league tables and benchmarking. And you get a group of farmers together. Once they get the confidence in each other, and that doesn't generally take that long, they're quite happy to share that information and recognise who's top third, who's bottom third, and well, what we're going to do about this thing. Benchmarking, absolutely crucial as far as I'm concerned in terms of uh, getting that information. And for that, you need data. And I think that's one of the areas where we do 
we've touched on a common theme there, is actually having that data, providing that data to the farmer. How do they actually collect that data? It needs to be relevant data. Um, I had the great pleasure of doing some consultancy work out in Russia. And uh, it was on an arable farm, and they showed us they brought these volumes, these enormous books. And this was work rates on different fields, different conditions, different times of the year. And that was the Bible. That was what they actually used to make the decisions. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That means that with the 3rd of February we go into that field. Because that data had all been collected. The data we need is the stuff that we need to manage the business. That sort of spurious data, I've seen people collect, and some of the computer systems allow you to yeah. itemize nuts and bolts by tractor <coughs> and all the rest of it. That's not necessarily good management information. What you want is the data that actually allows you to make informed decisions. So people have said you can't manage what you can't measure. To some extent, that is true. What we need to do is make sure we're measuring the right things that we want to manage. So in technical performance, to say, one of the ways of getting past that gulf is the benchmarking, but also making sure we've got the data that we can actually use to make sure those benchmarks are um, consistent. Get into slightly finer detail, fixed costs. One of my colleagues used to talk about the three M's, men, money, and machines. Um, the value of family labor I've put in there. I mean, yeah, the amount of employed labor on farms continues to diminish. The value of family labor, I don't think it's fully recognized. And about, in actual fact, in many of the accounts, if they actually sat down and took the work that the spouse, the partner, as well as son and daughter put into that business, it would actually be quite a significant thing. <coughs> because if you actually look at the benefit they're taking out of that in terms of personal drawings, pounds per hour probably don't constitute the living wage. Some of them are very low indeed. Um, so, but you need the labor there to, to do it. I think one of the challenges with managed farms, where there's a farm manager in that unit, is how do you actually cover that cost? Because that's normally taken in the drawings of the proprietor. So that can be a real challenge in that circumstance. Money, borrowing costs. Tom quoted a very good rate just now. Uh, I'm going to come on to a bit more about that from my fifth one. But what are, what, what are they being lent against? Is it security or is it viability? To me, it should always be on viability. It has to be a viable proposal. It's all very well saying security is there but it needs to be on a viable proposal. And there's various ways of measuring that, and I think that's something we should be able to educate the industry on. And uh, tooled up to be independent. This is the machines bit. How George Barton, uh, an old colleague of mine who used to go up to uh, East Lothian, he actually did, with well, his East Lothian discussion group, he actually got them all to itemize the machinery, and said, right, well, you're all gonna farm. You're all gonna be the farm manager for the collective, for everybody's farm. So there's a few thousand acres of there. They could get rid of about 15 tractors, five combines. Uh, there was various other bits of kit they could have got rid of. So the, the duplication of effort that was in there was enormous. They, they, each, that was, they sat down themselves and came up with this, this, this cost-cutting, this, 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 this uh, sale, this rope, so they could get rid of all this kit. That's what they actually needed to run that business on that scale. And it's all about resilience. It's all about being resilient. And a lot of farmers will say, I need that because I, need, I can go when I want to go. Uh, I can get it combined when I need to get it combined. I can make sure I get it in the right conditions. It's like an insurance policy. And like all insurance policies, you need to question, can, can you afford the premium? So to me, the machines bit, because of the high capital value, it needs to, you know, there's, a, there's a compromise there with resilience. And finally, payback. <laughs> I don't mean that in any sort of revenge context. I mean that in terms of a financial payback. The number of times uh, that farmers will go through an exercise to extend the borrowing without even considering the payback part of it. The theory is that you know, it's borrowed, and it's invested, and you actually pay that back. At some point, you've actually said, well, yeah, that money's paid back to the lender. Now, that could be, if it's on overdraft, that could be on demand at any point. If you've got a fixed term, long term loan, uh, long term assets, short term borrowing is typically what we see. Long-term assets bought with overdraft should definitely be long-term assets bought with long-term finance, and then you've got the prospect of built-in payback. You've got that repayment in there. Uh, we can do the sensitivity analysis on it. At one point, I had a client who insisted that every time we replaced a tractor, he did an internal rate of return calculation. So it's all about net present values. And he actually had to show it made more profit to replace the tractor. 
Now, I've never managed to get that to balance yet, but when I eventually worked out that the client had no idea what an internal rate of return was, it was just a percentage as far as he was concerned, that actually solved that problem quite easily. <laughs> so I'm not suggesting that we should have that internal rate of return, but we need to, it comes back to that, the machines I was talking about earlier, considering just how much that sort of investment is. One of my colleagues used to talk about the equipment as being deferred rust. He talked about depreciation payments. He talked about deferred rust. And certainly, you talked about, Tom, about the, that, that shiny new tractor that was sitting there on the balance sheet when it actually comes to the cash flow and looking to extend. Where's the payback on that? Where is that actually being refunded from? So, that was my five. Uh, hopefully that's, um, I think it actually complements Tom's five. Yes, it does.